in continuation to the applications of solubility product we said a, a better way to do quantitation other than gravimetric analysis where you do the weighing of the precipitated salt is actually to do what you call the volumetric analysis and this is a technique most of you know about it in which the volume of a standardized solution in a burette is used to react you know with an unknown amount of um, um, analyte you know that is present in an Elmer flask and if the stoichiometric um, relationship is known between the reaction of the titrant you know which is here and the concentration is known and the analyte you know that is present then we can actually determine uh, the concentration of the unknown okay and we normally use a burette uh, but lately of course you know with advancement with instrumentation burettes are falling out of favor and instead you're gonna see um, the, 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 the titrations have been automated uh, using these um, instrumentation called auto titrators you know so in the industry you're gonna find in most cases people use auto titrators you know to do volumetric analysis or titrations it's very important you know to remember that when you are doing titrations the k you know the equilibrium constant you know has to be fairly large meaning you know your reactants you know which which, which often you know is your, you know plus um pl pl plus um your, your reactants you, you know going back to the going to the products the KSP needs to be very very large okay and of course your reactant in this case you know would be your titrant whatever is coming from the burette that is plus your analyte that's your reactant really you know going to whatever the products all right so that is the K that we are talking about and like I say, the stoichiometry is known, you know, so if you know the number of moles of the titrant uh, reacting with the number of moles of the analyte that you don't know the concentration, you know, then you can do a more um, e equivalent kind of calculation and determine uh, the concentration of the unknown. Now, remember, when you're doing titrations, you're looking for the equivalence point. And the equivalence point is a point at which you've added enough known volume of the titrant which the concentration is known anyway. And those number of moles that you've added equate to the amount of or to the moles of the analyte that is present. And so the reaction has gone to completion. So in essence, we are saying equivalence point is a point at which you have consumed all the analyte, you know, by adding enough titrant, which you know its concentration, you know, for the products, you know, to be formed. And remember, like I said, the K is very large. So for every drop of the titrant you add, it very quickly reacts with the analyte to give you a product and that way you're going to have an equivalent point. Uh -huh. hope it's clear. You know, the point at which you've consumed all the analyte is what you refer to as uh, the equivalence point. Now, whatever you see, whatever the detector sees, in most cases, if you're doing a burette, of course, the detector is your eye and it sees a color change. So whatever you see is what you refer to as the add point. But remember, an add point, you know, is always uh, erratic, you know, because the add point requires you to add a little more titrant, you know, than you need to react with the analyte for you to see the add point. And so the titration error, really, which is inescapable if at all you're doing the color type of indicator titrations is, you know, the add point. The color that you see, the point at which you see the head point, the volume at which you see the head point.
minus the equivalence point, which is the theoretical, the theoretical point, you know, at which you've added enough titrant, you know, is referred to as a titration error. Having said that, you can actually escape the titration error if at all, you know, you use potentiometry or instrumentation as another way of doing the detection of your equivalence point. For example, if at all you are doing, and I gotta give an example uh, later on of the solubility product, but if you are doing acid-based titration, you can use pH electrode as a way to determine the equivalence point. And because you're using a sensor, in that case, you know there is no titration error. All right, so take note of that. If at all you're doing potentiometric kind of detection for titration, you can get rid of the titration error. On the other hand, if at all you're doing um, the calorimetric um, burette type of calibration, you know, then of course, you know, there will be a titration error. So going back, you know, to precipitation type of titration, you can do many different types of quantitative analysis of different species just by converting them, you know, into salts, where you're adding a titrant to those species to give you a salt, and then you determine, you know, the add point, and, and that way you can determine the concentration of those salts. For example, you know, you can react silver as a titrant, you know, with all this, you know, for example, you can take the silver as a titrant, you know, react it with iodide, iodide, you know, gives you the K, and you can see this K really, you know, is equal to one of a KSP, because the product that you are getting, you know, is silver iodide, you know, which is, which is a salt, which is a precipitate, okay? And you can see the reason why it's one of a KSP is because the silver iodide, if you dissolve it in water, you know, the equilibrium constant is a KSP now, which is equal to, you know, the constituent ions, you know, plus the iodide, you know, and of course all of them are, are, are aqueous, okay? So the point is, you know, you get a titration curve like this, you know, where you're adding the titrant to the unknown, you know, which is the iodine in this case. And you can see as you increase the amount of silver, you know, it keeps, um, it keeps increasing the silver and you get, you know, this kind of a titration curve, you know, that is there. As a silver volume, as you keep adding the volume of the silver, its concentration, the concentration of the silver, you can see that's what you're plotting in the y-axis. And remember, the small p refers to the negative log, all right? And, you know, so you can see the silver, you know, keeps increasing as you add the silver into it. On the other hand, you know, you can see if we plotted instead the p of iodide, and this is a volume of the silver as a titrant. Take note of this, you know, the... Um, the calibration or rather the titration curve is going to look sort of as a mirror image of this, right? You know, because you're going to see the iodide would keep uh, decreasing, you know, as you add the titrant. So you can see there are four regions in the titration curve, you know, before titration has happened or before equivalence point. And then this region really, the midpoint, remember, that's the equivalence point. The midpoint is the equivalence point. And then after that, you've got, you know, the post-equivalence, you know, which is up here after you've consumed all the iodide, you know, by adding the silver. So the only thing that really you're adding, you know, is silver in water. I hope that's clear. You know, so what are the factors, you know, that influence analytical titrations, particularly, you know, the precipitation types of titrations? You're going to see concentration of the analyte, you know, is critical. As the concentration of the analyte uh, increases, 
you know you get a better or sharper add point and you're gonna see you know this uh, calibrate this titration curve shows that as the concentration of the iodide you know increases you're gonna see you've got a bigger gap you know in the titration curve you got a bigger gap you know in the titration curve curve you know meaning the add point you know is steeper so ideally we are saying that we need more concentrated analyte you know so that the add point is very very clear okay it's almost what we talked about with the limits of detection if at all you've got very low concentration of the analyte it's gonna be very difficult you know to see the add point so a situation like this if at all I've got high concentration of iodide maybe my titration curve is gonna look like that if at all I've got low concentration you know maybe my titration curve is gonna look like that and so the add point is very difficult to detect you know for very low concentration meaning um, the detection limit is almost getting reached you know at very low concentration hopefully that's clear now the other factor you know that affect precipitation types of titrations is the magnitude of the KSP very important how big the KSP is or the equilibrium constant you know which we've said they are synonymous you know because the equilibrium constant you know for the titration reaction is the inverse you know of the KSP I'll give you an example assume you're doing a titration where you've got a sample that has got iodide it's got bromide and it's got chloride in it and you're trying to analyze uh, the respective composition of all those ions so you can do titration you know using silver where you take silver add it to the iodide and that precipitates you take silver add it to bromide in the same solution and you know the bromide precipitates due to the formation of that salt and so on and you can see because the KSPs you know are radically different you're gonna see that uh, the add point is much better or is much steeper you know for the iodide because the KSP you know is very very large and similarly you know if at all the KSP is more for example you know the chloride compared to the iodide you can see the inflection the inflection point you know is fairly smaller compared to the iodide so there's another huge factor you know that determine you know analytical titration is a KSP and I hope it's clear you know the larger the KSP or rather the smaller the KSP the bigger you know the equilibrium constant the sharper the add point so I hope you can see that like I've said before you can titrate a mixture just like we did before you know with uh, precipitating a mixture you can titrate ions in a mixture you know for example in this case I've got iodide you know the iodide we know precipitates first you know because we know that uh, its uh, KSP is much much bigger or smaller you know compared to this other one you know the chloride you know so it's gonna precipitate first and so you can actually do uh, detect them separately so you can see the equivalence point you know for the iodide because it's precipitating fast and then the equivalence point you know for the chloride later on as it precipitates uh, next so essentially you can see that you can analyze ions in a mixture using precipitation type of titration So similarly, you know, you can give an example like this where you've got ions such as carbonates in water, chlorides in water, phosphates in water, which is very common, you, you know, for example, you're trying to analyze wastewater, often you'll be looking for these kinds of ions. And so you can use precipitation titration, you know, where I add silver, you know, from a burette or using another titrator, you know, to get uh, the respective salt and you know I should be able you know so that's the volume of the silver plus 
and you know that is um, you know the concentration of the silver as I add it and so you're gonna see you, you, you know the titration curve is gonna look like that where this one precipitates first precipitates second precipitates last so how do you determine what precipitates first again remember what we said you simply calculate the molar solubility and so the smaller the molar solubility the faster it's gonna precipitate for example in this case the molar solubility is that the molar solubility of the other one so the uh, silver chloride is that and so on and so you can see you know the carbonates precipitates first you know and then the chlorides you know are gonna precipitate second and then lastly you know you're gonna have the phosphates you know precipitating precipitating last now because in this case you have the molar solubility fairly close to each other it would be such that the titration reaction may not be too accurate because of core precipitation so you may lose a little bit of chloride when you're precipitating carb uh, carbonate and we may also lose a little bit, you know, of uh, phosphates when you are precipitating these and so on. Because you can see, you know, the solubility products are fairly close. So it may not be a very accurate, you know, precipitation type of titration. So ideally, we want the KSPs to be radically different for you to get a very accurate, you know, type of uh, precipitation type of titration. But hopefully it's clear, you know, what you need to do if you have these kinds of problems. So all what I've talked about when you're using silver as a titrant is what you refer to as a gentimetric titration. So if I tell you you've got silver, that's a B-red, as a titrant, and you're trying to analyze maybe iodide in water, maybe chloride in water, maybe bromide in water. When you're doing these type of reactions, you refer to that as a gentimetric titration. So the titrant, you know, is silver. The titrant is silver. And of course, its concentration is known. It's what you refer to as a primary standard. Its concentration is known. And I think I already talked to you guys before about this. We've got three types of a gentimetric titrations you know based on um, the different types of indicators that they use for example you've got the mole type of a gentimetric titration and in this case you know we use chromate as an indicator we have the phagen type of a gentimetric titration and in this case you know you use um, uh, dichlorofluorensin you know what you call dichlorofluorensin dichlorofluorensin you know is an indicator so this one is an adsorption indicator and this one is also a direct titration you know meaning the chloride uh, is being added you know to the silver and uh, is a direct reaction and lastly you have what you call the volherd type of a gentimetric titration and this is what you call a back titration all right this is what you call a back titration and the way you do this is you take the sample maybe it has chloride that's what you're analyzing you add an excess you add an excess you know of the titrant so that you react you know so you add an excess of the titrant so that you react everything you know for the chloride okay and so you're going to have an excess uh, silver that you need to determine how much is there. And then now you titrate the excess silver and you titrate it with thiocyanate. And you get the add point, you know, using iron, you know, as an indicator. Okay. So this one is what you call a back titrator. Okay. Where you take again the chloride, you add it to an excess of silver you know and then you determine the excess silver by titrating it with thiocyanate and you can determine how much chloride you know was present initially hopefully that's clear
So I've talked about, you know, using, you know, indicators, you know, like we said, add point creates an error, you know, because it's always an overshot, you know, of the equivalence point. But you can actually use instrumentation to determine the add point, you know, so you can use um, spectrophotometry really to determine the add point, even with precipitation types of titration. Because take note of this. You know, if you take, say, a cuvette, you know, it has your iodide, that's what you're titrating, and you're adding silver, okay? And then you've got, you know, your spectrophotometer, you know, so this one is light. Light, you know, that is passing through the cuvette, and then you've got the detector. So, so, so you can see, as you add the silver, you create a salt, a precipitate, you know, the silver iodide. And so as the salt is added, you, you know, as you keep adding the silver, you make more salt. And so that deflects the light. And so the absorbance, you know, becomes less and less and less. Okay. And so you can actually plot, you know, the absorbance, you know, as a function of silver volume that you're adding and you can see the absorbance is gonna keep decreasing you know as you add the silver and so you can actually use spectrophotometry you know as a way to do the add point or the equivalence point detection even when you're doing precipitation titration you know i hope that's clear that you can actually use spectrophotometry even when you're doing you know titrations and there are two types, actually, you know, of those types of um, spectrophotometries where you're trying to measure, you know, the turbidity or the dissolved solids, you know, of uh, solution. Those methods that you call turbidimetry, you know, which measures the transmittance of light. And you have nephelometry, you know, that measures light that is being scattered. And again, the difference is the location at which you position the detector. Okay, so you can see with nephelometry, you position the detector at an angle, maybe right here, relative, you know, to the incidence. Whereas with turbidimetry, you know, you position, you know, the detector very similar to what you do with the regular spectrophotometry. So you are measuring the amount of light, you know, that passes through. Hope that's clear. So essentially, it's all spectrophotometry both the types of spectrophotometry when you are detecting you know dissolved solids or precipitates precipitates so lastly to conclude you may be asked to enumerate factors that affect solubility and we've covered them based on solubility product equilibrium now remember we said common ion effect affects solubility but are you dissolving um, a salt in pure water is gonna be very different than if you are dissolving it in a solution that contains a constituent ion of that salt or what you are calling the common ion effect and remember we gave you an example on that of course the type of solvent that you use affects solubility I think it's fairly obvious the temperature, of course, is critical. You know, if at all the temperature is higher, you tend to dissolve more and so on. pH, you know, affects solubility as well. So you can see actually a nexus between solubility product equilibria and, you know, uh, acid-base equilibria, you know, the KAB and so on. You know, pH, you know, does affect solubility and of course there's an interplay between those two types of reactions you know the solubility product and the acid base type of reaction of course we know this is the basis for example of the acid rain like i said before dissolving coral coral re coral reefs the other thing that affects, you know, solubility, you know, is ionic strength. And I try to explain to you the very importance of ionic strength, you know, when you're trying to do dissolution, you know, but also, you know, when you're trying to do detection using 
uh, potentiometry. And I gave an example of a pH electrode where seawater containing exactly the same hydronium ion would give you very different type of pH compared to deionized or fresh water. Complex ion formation, you know, is another factor, you know, that affects solubility product equilibrium. And I know I didn't talk a lot about complexation, but I will do that later on, maybe in a, in a lecture or two in the next weeks. And lastly, hydrolysis, you know, also, you know, affects uh, solubility. Okay. But you got a compound that undergoes hydrolysis you're going to see, you know, that um, that affects solubility. Lastly, you can be asked to enumerate factors, you know, or requirements of a titration reaction. Maybe you can be asked, you know, to design an analytical method, you know, based on precipitation titration or even based on acid-based titration. So what are the factors that you should be looking for? you know, to design that kind of analytical method. Remember, for you to be able to do a titration and do quantitative titration, of course, that is, you know, the reaction must be of known stoichiometry. You know, you should be able to know how many moles of the products are reacting, you know, to give you the moles in the, uh, or, or the, moles in the, in the products. How many reactants are reacting to give you the moles of the product? The reaction must be rapid. We already talked about that. You know, the K must be huge, must be huge. And we said as huge as 10 to power 6. Ideally, that's what you're looking for in a titration reaction. Also, the products, you know, should be specific. You know, there should be no side reactions. There should be a fairly neat, simple uh, reaction that doesn't result into side products. Now you should be able to find a way of measuring the equivalence point. The equivalence point. Very important. You need to know, you need to know at what point have you consumed all your reactant. And that's what you call the equivalence point. So you either use a color indicator, you know, of course we talked about an error in that case, or you can use an instrumentation, you know, such as potentiometry you know, to measure the equivalence point, or you can even use spectrophotometry, like what I've just explained, to measure the equivalence point, you know, um, for, for your reaction. So you should be able to have a way of determining the equivalence point. And lastly, and I think I already talked about this, you know, that uh, the reaction should be quantitative, you know, it should be rapid and quantitative, meaning the K should be fairly large. So I'd like you to remember, you know, these very important factors when you're designing not just precipitation titration, but any type of titration reaction.